Hi, this is Stephen Cherry for Radio Spectrum. A thread on Reddit once started, so I recently got a job offer that is about 15 miles away from where I live. I don't have a car, so I'm planning on commuting by bus. However, the commute is estimated to last anywhere from 70 to 85 minutes. This is my first post-grad job. I really need the experience. However, I'm wondering if it's worth it. Two hours a day, just in my commute. Metropolises like London, Tokyo, or New York are built on a backbone of subways and rail transit. But in much of the world, people without cars travel by bus. And that's a problem if a 15-mile commute takes five times as many minutes. Marchetti's constant, named after Italian physicist Cesare Marchetti, is the average time people spend on their daily commute, which is approximately a half hour each way all around the world. The average U.S. commute is about 27 minutes, up 8% from a decade ago. But that averages people who walk 10 minutes to work with people who drive for an hour. It averages people who have a quick subway ride and people taking two or three buses that run only infrequently. In the mid-2000s, the megacity of Sao Paulo developed a system of buses making limited stops and with their own lanes that my colleague Erico Guiso wrote about in 2007. It's a scheme that perhaps made sense 15 years ago, trying to combine the best of highway transport with the best of rail transit. But in the mind of another Italian physicist who has turned his attention and his career to transportation, we now have enough computing power, smartphones, AI, and the cloud, for a different kind of solution. My guest today, Tommaso Jekyllin, is a physicist and industrial designer. After studying quantum mechanics in Padua, Italy, and industrial design in Venice, he co-founded something called Next Future Transportation. For the past seven years there, he has been developing a system of bus pods, one that in effect chops up a bus into car-sized pieces and has the potential to combine the best of commuter buses with the best of Uber. He joins me via Skype. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me here. Chopping up a bus into car-sized pieces is my characterization of the system. Why don't you describe it yourself? We describe them uh, like a very short section of bus that can uh, dock together, forming a longer unit. It's like a train when, where all the cars can uh, drive themselves. All of them, they can be independent. They can be like cars or like taxi. When they are alone and when they join together, they can form a bus. And, but the most important thing is that they communicate with each other physically. So when they are connected, the doors open in between. So basically, they create something that we call a stopless station because the passengers can freely walk between one unit and the other internally without the need for the entire bus to stop, to drop off and pick up them again. So they're a little bit longer than a smart car. They're self-driving. Uh, they have doors at either end. Uh, they communicate with one another and their passengers constantly. They made up at highway speeds so smoothly that you can walk from one to the other. And they know who needs to get where and which pod needs to connect with which. For potentially hundreds of pods and tens of thousands of people, maybe 24 hours a day, uh, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> yes, it seems like a very complicated thing, but actually we try to simplify the project from the starting of it. What we are trying to do now is to focus on uh, the docking procedure and the modularity of the system instead of being uh, too focused on the self-driving because the self-driving part is the most difficult thing to do and it's the most uh, difficult also to certify and to, to be legal on the road at the moment. We're going to get to all of that, but let me first ask what the experience will be like. As I understand it, uh, I'm sitting at home in the morning, getting ready for work. Uh, my phone tells me a pod has arrived. I get on. The system figures out that another pod is going to go near my destination. It determines where the two pods should connect. Uh, my phone alerts me when that moment is near and tells me which pod to switch to because there may be several connected in this train-like way at this point. 
Am I picturing this correctly? Exactly. The only difference is that it's um, very likely that you don't have more than two pods docked together at the same time. Because generally, the first mile is covered by one pod that pick you up alone, like a taxi that you call. And then afterwards, when you're merging into main roads, it docking to another pod that generally it's uh, already almost full because they have done the same thing again and again. So you just walk to the pod that have uh, already few people inside. So you leave your pod completely empty and your pod will detach and go to pick up other people. So it's like a rally race. From the central city in the afternoon back to the suburbs, it would be the same in reverse? Exactly. Generally, you are not that uh, interested in timing when you are going back to home. So um, the vehicles will split and with 10 people inside, and they will do uh, two or three stops before you get home. So you don't need to get home completely alone. That's a slightly difference from the beginning of the trip in the morning. Yes, in the central city model, uh, people leave for work at very different times, but frequently people leave work at pretty close to the same time. So it is a, a little different in that respect. Does your modeling tell you if I have, say, in my own car, a uh, maybe a half hour commute with the pods connecting and multiple people and perhaps even waiting at a pod sort of bus shelter equivalent for a few minutes for my next pod to come? What would be the average transit time? I, I imagine it would increase a little bit at least. Well, this is the difference. You never have to stop to wait for another pod. The pod always dock together when they are traveling. And if you cannot uh, find another pod traveling in your direction, you will get directly to destination. Because we want to differentiate our system from uh, traditional buses and to increase a lot the comfort for the passengers. So we absolutely never stop to drop off people and to pick up uh, another pod. In case they have connection, let's say pod connection, they will dock together the two pods and the people will just walk from one to the other. So it's very different from uh, a bus a transportation system in this, uh, for this feature. To reply to your question, the, we, we did a lot of simulation and roughly the increase in the travel time, it's roughly 5%. That's very little. And there is an advantage of not having to park at the destination. Uh, so that, that you might actually save that 5% as well. This depends on a certain amount of scale, I would imagine. And so do you have any thoughts on what the optimum geographies are? Is it is big metropolitan areas with lots of suburbs? What about smaller ones like, say, Pittsburgh? The city is 300,000 people and the metro area is about four times that. Uh, and what about cities like, I don't know, in Albany, New York or a South Bend, Indiana? Uh, which have about 100,000 each? Well, we focus on cities that have very dense downtown and very sparse suburb area. So most of the cities in the U.S., they are like that. We concentrated also on cities like Dubai, that they have a, a very concentrated traffic in the main road of the city, uh, Sheikh Zayed Road. So these cities are the most optimizable by our system. On the other side, uh, European cities very with a um, fairly homogeneous density of pickup and drop off, uh, so origin and destination matrix. In that case, the optimization level is slightly less. Now, you first developed a 1 to 10 scaled prototype and brought it to Dubai, where I guess it was enough of a hit that uh, they had you build two pods to be tested there. And you've trialed some key technology pieces, the uh, the linking up and the walking from one to the other at speed, uh, the cloud intelligence, the communicating to the mobile device app. Uh, each of these seems like a huge challenge. Yes, it is. Honestly, it, it was very critical for us to test the vehicle in a one-to-one -one scale after the one-to-ten scale was working. So we convinced the Sheikh of Dubai to buy two vehicles. And uh, up to the very end of the engineering and prototyping phase, uh, we were a little bit afraid uh, about the docking procedure. Then afterward, it worked perfectly. 
So every calculation we have done was good. And uh, we have done a very, very good job and good showcase in Dubai. Does Dubai's cities have the kind of density and uh, central city, sparse suburbs that you imagine to be optimal? And, and do they have any thoughts about building out a complete system for themselves? Yes, the city of Dubai, it's perfect for our system, especially because the, um, the destinations are very, very concentrated. For example, Dubai Mall. Dubai Mall, it's a, it's a destination of very, very um, punctual, very, very specific. And on the other hand, you have uh, almost every house, it's uh, sparse in the other part of the city, that's it, Sharjah that it's uh, like the residential uh, area of Dubai. So we, we have done a lot of simulation, especially in Dubai, and this is uh, optimizing um, very much the system, the traffic in Dubai. Now, do they have uh, much of a public transport network there now? And more generally, do you envision this system coexisting with transport systems, or do you expect it to largely replace them? I think that it will uh, coexist. Because it, it's not trying to take uh, take away passengers from buses or uh, metro. They are trying to take out a private car. So, in fact, the system, it's a little bit more um, expensive than uh, regular buses. But nonetheless, it's picking you up at home. So it's much more similar to a taxi. The, um, let's say the price tag, it's in between them. And it's uh, much more cheaper than uh, having a private car and to manage them, to park them. So it's much more convenient and also cheaper than a private car. But at the same time, it's uh, cheaper than a taxi, even if it's basically giving you the same service. So the same time to destination and the same ubiquity as a taxi. In uh, New York, for example, there are single and double buses. Sometimes it's standing room only, but sometimes they're only carrying a handful of people. When you chop up a bus, to use my term, of uh, maybe 40 or 50 or 80 people into four or six or eight pods, each pod is closer to its capacity. How expensive might five pods end up being compared to, say, a, a 50-person bus? Five pods? will be roughly equivalent to a 12-meter bus. So we are trying to get to the price where five pods will be equivalent also in terms of the price to an electric bus, a premium electric bus. So this is our goal. Just to be clear, a 12-meter bus would have, say, what seating capacity? It, it really depends if it's a city bus or an intercity bus, but generally it goes from 50 to 70 people. Uh, so similar capacity, really, because your pods would seat six and have a total capacity of 10. Very comfortably. They can go up to 15 people each pod if you want to have the same density, per, so people per square meter of a typical city bus. A point I haven't heard in any of the presentations of yours that I've watched is that in an all-electric vehicle system, a single pod can go out of service to recharge instead of an entire 50-person or 75-person bus. So only uh, one-fifth of the bus, so to speak, has to go offline. Exactly. This is a, this is a very interesting feature because it's uh, like having swappable batteries because you can swap one pod and just recharge the pod uh, that it's empty. So you cut your capacity at that moment by 10% or 20% instead of the entire capacity of the bus. It seems like pods are also going to be much more manageable within the cities than buses, uh, making left turns on narrow streets, parking, pulling over. Bus stops nowadays typically take up 100 feet of road or sidewalk. There are a lot of things to like about these smaller pods. Yes, in fact, you can park two pods stuck together in the place where you generally put a traditional car. I think you know that I teach at New York University's engineering school as an adjunct professor. Uh, there's an NYU connection to this story, as I understand it. Yes, yes. And actually, Joseph Chow featured us in a paper 
And afterwards, we started a, a collaboration with them. And so they are doing a, a research paper on this modularity and the benefit or eventually any effect of the modularity that is calling in route transfer. So it's the transfer of the passengers while they are going on the road without stopping. It's a very interesting collaboration, actually. Yeah, Chow is the uh, deputy director of uh, C2Smart, which stands for Connected Cities with Smart Transportation. And there was also an important contribution by a graduate student as part of his master's thesis. Yes, exactly. Nick Karos was part of the master's thesis and uh, did a great job in describing the behavior of our vehicles. Tom, what sort of timeline are we on? Do we have to wait for others to perfect the self-driving aspect? Do you have any idea when we would see a full system ready to be built? Well, at the moment, we are doing a lot of studies to understand if uh, the system makes sense before self-driving will be legal. So, for example, um, when you split the bus, uh, each pod will be driven by one of the passengers. So it's like an hybrid between uh, Uber and a traditional bus. So our next step is to certify the vehicle in Europe at the moment for uh, European laws to be uh, road legal in all the public roads with the driver. So uh, driverless will be a uh, next step, but not um, not right now. And in the long run, you envisioned that these pods could also do package delivery as almost a, an additional business model. Yes, they can do let's say, package logistics. But the most interesting thing is to do retail logistics. So not just delivering to you the package like Amazon is doing, but delivering to you the entire retail experience because each pod can be dressed, can be customized like a room, like a retail store. So when it's coming to you uh, or in motion, uh, in the future, it will really be um, a new business line for us. And it will be really the future of retail, especially in this COVID period in which it's a little bit more uh, uh, frightening go to the mall. Tom, I mentioned at the top of the show your eclectic background. You also paint uh, real paintings that have been featured in art exhibitions. And you've written that and this is a quote of yours, art reaches the eyes and the heart of the user. Calling the viewer a user uh, suggests that these are closely related passions for you, art and science and technology, are they? Absolutely. I always try to merge them, to mix them, to create something that it's more than the two parts uh, separated because generally art, uh, it doesn't really use the science to get to the point, uh, to get to be fully useful for people. And I'm trying to do something that it's not just expressing myself, but it's trying to be something really useful, something that it, it's doing good for uh, for the whole world. Uh, well, Tom, I think you've come up with an artful, elegant solution to what has been an intractable urban and especially suburban problem. I wish you and the project In Boca a Lupo and I thank yes, you. Yes, in bocca al lupo. <laughs> and I thank you for joining me today. Uh, grazie. Prego. We've been speaking with Tommaso Jacqueline, co-founder and CTO of Next Future Transportation, which wants to reimagine Uber as a public transit system where connecting from one bus to another is as easy as walking from the kitchen to the living room. This interview was recorded October 2nd, 2020. Our thanks to Raul at Gotham Podcast Studio for audio engineering and to Chad Crouch for our music. Radio Spectrum is brought to you by IEEE Spectrum, the member magazine of the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. For Radio Spectrum, I'm Stephen Sherry.